I am thrilled this morning to introduce our keynote, Dr. Robin DeRosa. Dr. DeRosa joins us uh, from Plymouth State University, where she is the Director of Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative. She previously served as a professor of both English and interdisciplinary studies. She's a national advocate for building sustainable public ecosystems for learning and writes and lectures often on how open infrastructure and learner design architectures can focus higher education on serving students more equitably and responsibly, something that's of a key importance in this time. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. DeRosa. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you to everybody who is here with us. And before I start sharing my screen and jump in, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, and we'll talk more about this uh, in, the, in the keynote itself, but I just wanted to acknowledge um, the tensions that are surrounding us all right now, and you are joining us from all over the place and could be um, really feeling the effects um, both of the stresses around COVID um, and also what's happening in Minnesota right now. So I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your time with us and uh, hopefully the world is ready to heal itself soon. So with that, I am going to do the screen share and hopefully this all goes well. Okay, Jackie or someone, how's it looking? You see in my slide there? Great. Yep, it looks great. Perfect. Um, okay, so, you know, the, I'm so happy to be with you. And of course, when we originally planned this keynote, I was really gonna be focusing on open education, which I am going to talk about today. Um, but obviously with, with COVID and with the fact that all of us um, are thinking about what's going on, between our spring classes and what happens right now this summer and all of the uncertainty around fall, it seemed odd to come and give a talk that wasn't connected to any of that uncertainty that we're all dealing with. So in part, that's what I'm going to be looking at today is um, the context of COVID uh, that, is, that is surrounding us right now. It seems like a million years ago, but it was just March 11th when uh, the WHO declared that coronavirus was in fact a global pandemic. And the timing of this was so interesting because on the 11th, the pandemic uh, was officially declared. And it was actually the 12th that we started getting all of the headlines about colleges moving classes online. Um, what that meant, I think, for a lot of us who are classroom folks, was that we did not have a lot of time to think about that, what a lot of people call the pivot to online. Pivot is such a sort of ballet term for something that was probably not quite as graceful for many of us. Um, but it really seemed, even if uh, COVID had a long launch ramp, we didn't have a very long onboarding process to figure out how this was going to affect our work with our students. Um, but look at this, by March 23rd, we were already seeing articles from equity research firms talking about the coronavirus as an opportunity for education companies to increase their um, stock, uh, stock values around the kind of platforms that deal with online learning. This makes sense, of course, because we were all sort of desperate for solutions as we tried to take whole institutions and move them um, into online environments when maybe all of them weren't there before. Um, but some of the tone of this kind of freaked me out when I started seeing it. Like, look at this one article at the bottom. Um, the virus is spreading so vigorously that it's infected more than 340,000 people in 192 countries and territories and caused nearly 15,000 deaths as of March 23rd. That horrifying statement comes in an article that's talking about how exciting an opportunity, uh, opportunity it is for these vendors to be selling these new platforms for online learning. Um, and I just started feeling uncomfortable with the kind of hovering of the vultures. Um, and I was also scared at my own institution about how desperate we were for solutions. 
um, that I started being concerned that we weren't being thoughtful about how we were going to respond. Um, so who were the beneficiaries to the move to online? Um, we saw things like uh, remote proctoring software absolutely explode as we moved online. And part of the reason was that, you know, we used to offer um, tests, quizzes, assessments in our classroom, and we could just sort of watch everybody take them, oftentimes with a paper and, and pen. But when we moved online, we, we were so rushed that we had those same assessments and we knew now that they were really not well designed for an online environment because someone could just Google all the answers um, and write them down. So instead of taking the time to change our assessments, which of course is a real challenge, um, many schools turned quickly to uh, these proctoring softwares, which do things like um, lock down students' browsers, sometimes even track eye movements um, or record students taking the, the tests. Um, I don't necessarily have a problem with any of these softwares, depending on the pedagogy of the professor who's using them. Um, but I did wonder what the landscape was doing as it was shifting so quickly and we had so little time for faculty to think about it. Um, the ed tech industry in 2019 was a $19 billion industry, right? That's how much they were investing in selling students and teachers platforms and softwares for, um, for teaching. Again, all of that stuff is helpful. I probably use a really you know, large um, number of things that come out of this ed tech industry. But one of the questions I have is how much money is available, for example, to you as a community college professor, say, um, or as contingent faculty at a community college, or as a dean at a community college, how much investment is given to you to design the kinds of um, teaching tools that you need in your classroom. And my guess is you don't get a lot of investments um, for doing work like that or for learning about things that are available to you. So there's a really uneven investment um, between ed tech and between um, the faculty and staff on the ground with students. Uh, some of this ed tech, of course, is so important to us, right? I mean, here we are on Zoom, and I don't honestly know how I would be with you right now if we didn't have um, things like Zoom. But of course, one of the things we saw in the pivot to online is things like Zoom really became the way that we taught pretty quickly. We had this platform, and now suddenly that was one major way to, um, to reach our students. Was this the best way? We never stopped to ask those kinds of questions because it was available and it was well designed and we jumped in. I want to kind of take that whole conversation about ed tech and platforms and technology and put it up against some of what I saw at my own campus, which is um, a regional public university. It's the kind of college that lots of community college students transfer into in my state, which is New Hampshire. Um, and immediately after COVID hit, we launched what's called a FAST Fund to help our students survive some of the economic impact of the virus. And what I'm sharing here are some of the requests that students made to that fund um, as soon as COVID hit. And when I mean, when I say as soon as COVID hit, I mean we transitioned to remote learning and these emails came in uh, within two days of that. Here's one, my father and I are both out of work as of right now because our jobs closed down and we're having trouble feeding my four-year-old brother. With his daycare being closed, my dad's asked me to come home and babysit him while he hunts for jobs. We don't have access to Wi-Fi at our home, making it hard for me to focus on my studies to the best of my ability. This money could help my father and I gain Wi-Fi access and put food on the table. These kinds of things I think are no surprise to those of us who are on the ground in public colleges and community colleges. But most of the industry response around coronavirus, coronavirus was really focused on platforms and technologies, sometimes platforms and technologies that our students could barely even access because they didn't have um, laptops or data plans or Wi-Fi at their houses and they had dependent on being at college in order to access those things. Uh, here's another email um, from a student. My brother is currently going through cancer 
and my parents are struggling to get my rent payment in at the moment due to the coronavirus affecting their jobs. I signed my lease anticipating being here for the full year and now I have to pay for my rent for a house I'm no longer residing in. Thank you for providing any possible help. And another, I'm a self-supporting student and I have no home other than Plymouth State because my family is abusive. Sometimes I even have to support my mother financially out of my own pocket so she can survive. I need help now to cover the cost of food and hygiene products. Because of COVID, I lost my second job and the other one I have is on campus and it doesn't pay enough for me to make it. I feel like my life is under extreme uncertainty with Res Life moving students out, my finances being so low that I have no other home alternative if I moved out. I do not wanna be kicked out of the school because I would be in serious mental and physical danger. Um, for lots of students, particularly at community colleges, um, you know, we, we talk about adult learners. Of course, all of our students are adult learners, but particularly at community colleges um, where, uh, where they ha there are parents who have um, children to support, where they may be the primary wage earner, where they may be out of a job. Um, there wasn't a long gap before these crises were right upon us. And if you were like me, all of the learning outcomes from your class took a very rapid backseat to the fact that your students were not surviving almost immediately and we had all of this precarity. So the question I wanted to know as I thought about the move to teach my students during COVID um, was what if we responded, we designed a response that was specific to the needs of our students and not governed by the expectations of an industry. So forget what technologists say, forget um, what people tell us is important about online learning and look at the reality on the ground for our students and particularly at community colleges, let that be the guide for how we create our response. This becomes even more important for fall when we actually have a little bit of time to plan now. Do we wanna plan around the tools and technologies that are available to us or do we wanna plan around our students and their lives. So what I'm gonna to present to you now is an idea for using public health and the idea of public college and the public good as a guidebook for how we design our COVID response um, for teaching, particularly in the fall. And I hope this will be effective and helpful for all different roles in the college. So whether you're a faculty member, um, you work in a teaching and learning center, you're an instructional designer or a librarian, or an administrator or a state legislator. These are, um, this is all a guide for how we can work together to think about designing our responses. So I wanna start by thinking about the idea of education as a public good. Um, one of the things that has shifted over the last, say, five to 10 years, particularly since the 2008 recession um, is that we've transferred the cost of education from our entire population where we used to consider it a public good. It's now considered more of an individual consumer good. Um, so we've transferred more of the burden of cost, uh, which is no surprise to any of us, to our students and their, their families. <clears throat> um, this becomes Ironic when you look at things like the college earnings premium. Um, so one thing we know is that students who go to college and complete a four-year degree tend to make about 114% more money over their lifetimes um, than students who don't attain this degree. That percentage is a little bit lower for students who attain a two-year degree, but of course their investments are also lower. Um, so we know that the payoff for attending college is, uh, is enormous to individuals, but this is actually a reductive way of thinking about the benefits of college. So it's true and it's outstanding, but there's lots of other things we wanna pay attention to when we're thinking about college as a public good. So if you go to college um, personally, and I, I will say um, this, uh, all of this stuff, and actually if I go over 
to, I don't think I can right now, but later, um, I will make sure that you get a copy of this uh, slide deck. I can't use the chat right now as I'm screen sharing. Um, but this uh, slide deck has all of the annotations in the notes section, so you can look at the research here. This comes from Philip Trostel, who's an um, economics professor in Maine. Um, and if you go to college, you personally will be less likely to be unemployed, disabled, you'll be less likely to go to prison, more satisfied with your life, you'll have a better marriage. But things like um, lower mortality rates, um, being healthier, living longer, all of these things um, really resonate during a public health crisis like COVID. We realize that there are links between the health of our communities and college attendance. And these things have little to do um, with the personal earnings premium, right? With, with the fact that you personally will make more money. Um, in fact, many of those benefits related, for example, to health and, and um, disability and criminal activity, all of those benefits um, get passed to your children, whether or not they go to college. Um, so that's another example of how going to college isn't actually just an individual good, but it gets better. Um, regions, and this is something that community colleges and public regional universities really understand. Um, in a region, all people benefit when the rate of college attendance in that region um, goes up. So all people in that region, um, the average uh, uh, folks make more money, whether or not they go to college. There are greater tax revenues for the region, reduced needs for public assistance, more people volunteer and give to charity, more people vote, more people interact and trust people in their neighborhoods, and there are lowered crime rates. As we're looking at the situation in Minnesota, as we're thinking about COVID, we're thinking, wow, college attendance has a direct impact on some of the serious crises um, that we are facing right here today in the United States. Um, and the math really works out for the public good. Each potential college degree is conservatively worth $481,000 according to Trostel after you subtract out the cost of what that degree um, charges. The net government spending on higher education is actually negative when you factor in the economic benefits that come through. So the ROI, the return on investment in college students for taxpayers is 10%. There is no other place that taxpayers are making 10% off their investments right now, not in the bank, not in the stock market. Um, and the return on investments to state governments, Trostel estimates, um, at about 3% as well. So it's a myth that um, paying and supporting public colleges uh, costs people money. Um, whether you attend college or not, you make money off of college attendance. So I want to think about the public value of college when we think about finding ourselves in the moment of a pandemic. And pandemic comes from the Greek meaning of all the people. Um, and it's one of the things we're really wrestling with as a nation right now, right, is the idea of wearing masks, not so much to protect yourself, but to protect the people around you and therefore ultimately to slow the spread and stop the pandemic. In order to, to create um, public health policy that works, we need to be thinking as a public. It doesn't work individually. And, this is a similar thing when we think about public education. So what I'm gonna offer is a vision for the community college and you know, how blessed are we to be called community colleges, right? Um, thinking about the community and community college suggests that when we adapt to COVID, we're going to particularly excel if we stay deeply integrated with public need and with our communities. So what kind of a response does that look like? I'll tell you, it doesn't look like shopping around for some solution that gets sold to us from outside of our own community. What it comes from is looking at the needs around us and doing what we do best, um, which is meeting them and learning from the people um, who we serve. So uh, 
I'm going to introduce a framework for doing this work and I'm going to show you how you can adapt this framework for your own community college because it may not fit you perfectly because I de designed it for our public regional institution, which may be slightly different than your demographic. Um, so the framework I'm going to present, we created around a, a thing we call the rule of twos. And when I say we, um, I'm talking about my team in the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State. Um, one of the missions in our collab is uh, thinking about the benefits and plans for sustainable public higher ed. So that's what, what we work on there. Um, so the rule of twos is a way of helping faculty particularly feel less overwhelmed by going remote for COVID-19, particularly those of us who don't generally teach online. So instead of giving you, you know, 75 best practices and 20 new tools and a whole bunch of confusing things, or instead of just saying, please take your whole class and just teach it on Zoom, um, we try to look at what the two main things are that guide you principally in your course design, the two main learning outcomes for your course, the two tools that you might use. Um, and again, when I share this, you'll have an access to those rule of two worksheets if you'd like to use them with yourself or your faculty. Um, but in planning this framework, we especially didn't want to overwhelm people. We wanted to focus around pairs of things because even though we know there's a million different paths you could take to think about adjusting your community college for a time of crisis, nobody has the time or bandwidth. Lots of you are teaching high course loads. Many of you are teaching contingently, so you are not adequately compensated for this kind of um, planning and your schools are struggling with major budget crises that are, that are um, augmented now during COVID. So we need to keep it simple um, in order to protect our, our sanity. So the framework I'm going to uh, introduce that came out of a sort of rule of twos framework um, is called the ACE framework. It's, um, ACE stands for adaptability, connection, and equity. And these are the three design principles that will guide the practices that the ACE framework will suggest we look at as we turn particularly to fall planning. So I'm gonna go through each of these really quickly and I'm gonna start with adaptability. I don't think anybody is surprised by thinking that we need to be adaptable right now, that this is kind of the key thing that's being asked of us. Um, but adaptability is not really something that's just helpful during coronavirus and especially community college faculty know this well um, and, and I would say uh, student support staff as well would know this very well. I don't mean to be facetious, but the first bullet here uh, does say it all. What are the chances that your students will live a human life while enrolled in your course? I'm guessing they're close to 100%. What that means is that, yes, during coronavirus, your students may be challenged by illness, by job loss, by connectivity issues, by all sorts of things. But these are also um, challenges that hit our students all the time. For example, about a year before coronavirus, um, I worked closely with my first younger student, um, you know, just a, an 18 year old uh, woman in my class who ended up with a terminal cancer. She wanted to con continue studying in our program, but because of her treatments and her illness, many things were different for her about how she could access education. So the adaptability framework um, idea is that we can do this well and rethink a lot of practices for COVID, but these things could help us, particularly those of us who teach vulnerable students who are dealing with lots of life issues all the time as they're in school. Um, so one of the things I wanna think about is what could we do to make our institutions more flexible and think about all the levels of that. At the institutional level, how can we look at flexibility? At the program level, at the course level, at the assignment level, what would happen if we said, we never wanna close the gate on learning, no matter how challenged or vulnerable a student is? Um, can we use flexibility to allow the students to keep learning as long as they want to? Um, so that's the adaptability framework. Um, and we're gonna get into the nitty gritty don't worry about what all this means. Um, 
The second piece of ACE is a connection. One thing that happens with online learning a lot of times is that when we move online, we move to more individualized models, particularly when students don't have good internet connectivity. We allow them to work more at their own pace. They're not synchronously connecting with us as much. Um, and that's important sometimes because they don't have the technology they need. But if you look at things like your gen ed program or the mission statements of your college or what you say is great about the teaching at your college, mostly we talk about the connections between faculty and students. We talk about the projects that our students will undertake, the group work that they will do. Um, the ways that we connect our students with real world experiences. What that means is that when we move online, we don't want to lose that stuff and just create some competency based model, you know, of quizzing and learning and reading. We still want group work. We still want humanity. We still want um, engagements with the real world. How do we build that stuff in and not just choose um, platforms or design principles that turn our courses into much more individual experiences. And the final part of um, equity, wherever you are, whatever you do, um, we're dealing with the challenges of, um, of our students being left behind. We know that in community colleges that many of our students um, that we serve, we're trying to reach out to underserved populations who traditionally have been left out of higher ed. But we know that we still can't reach a lot of those students. With coronavirus and the move online, we know that lots of our students um, have been left behind. So the equity piece of ACE asks us particularly to look at the students who are alienated or challenged by the online modalities. Um, it asks us to think not just about how our students learn, but about how they get to the table to learn in the first place. Um, and what short term solutions might, be we might we be choosing that actually create longer term equity problems um, in, the uh, in the future. So we wanted to build into this framework um, a really foregrounded focus um, on equity, which is such a part of many of our missions. So the ACE framework works like this. Um, across the top, you'll see the three pieces of ACE, adaptability, connection, and equity. And along the side, there are three levels at which uh, these pieces um, can be manifested. So we can think about the assignment level as we're designing the assignments in our courses. We can think about the course level, which is kind of more about our syllabi. What, what are the course level decisions we're gonna make around adaptability, connection, and equity? And then finally, the institution level. Um, what things have to, have to happen even above your course in order to make this framework function? I will say I'm also engaged with other levels of the ACE framework. Um, for example, uh, the system level. Uh, my college is part of the University System of New Hampshire. But we're also working at the state level between systems, between our university system and our community college system, which are two separate systems in New Hampshire. So you could really follow the ACE framework through multiple levels, but you need to decide where you lay on this framework. Um, so for example, if you are an instructor, you're gonna be spending most of your time thinking about the assignment and course levels of ACE. If you are a dean or a provost or a college president, you might be looking at the institution level. If you are a um, legislator or a member of a board of trustees or a president, you may be looking more at a, state, at a state level. But the idea is that if our faculty are working really hard on professional development around assignment and course level stuff, but nobody's doing anything at the institution level, we're not gonna see as much of a return on our investments. We need to all get aligned at the different levels. And that's why I would say to faculty, um, it's not all on you to manage this. Um, you're, we've got to step up as faculty and do lots of things, but our institutions also have to, to get on board. So what you see inside the ACE framework, and again, you know, don't feel like you need to write all this stuff down. I've got links for you. 
where all of this is um, spelled out more intensely and you'll be able to engage with the, the different pieces on your own time. Um, but inside the, the framework, you're seeing what we call ACE informed practices. And these are the, the question of, you know, how do I actually do this? How do I actually make my assignments more adaptable? Um, how do I actually design an assignment for equity? Um, so those practices inside are using a rule of twos, um, two of the most important things that our team identified. At your school, you may actually switch out. You may not choose adaptability, connection, and equity. Many, many schools that are engaging with ACE are using those three, but you might need to tweak them to align with your mission and your pedagogy. If you do choose those three, you may find that certain of these practices need to be tweaked as you go through. Um, and obviously in this talk today, I'm not going to have time to go through all of these practices. So you can engage with them um, at our website in more detail. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to give you just a little bit of an example of what it looks like to dive into the ACE framework. Um, the idea here is that when you're planning for fall, you're not just freaking out like, should I try Zoom? And I heard Flipgrid is good. And like, you know, let me try emailing my students about how much I care about them. And instead, let's try to have kind of an organized response um, so that you feel like what you're doing is really in partnership with your colleagues and your institution. So I'm just diving into one little part of ACE. It's the equity column. Um, and what you'll see in the equity column is that the three boxes there represent the three different um, levels, the assignment level, the course level, and the institution level. And again, you could build out more levels of the ACE framework if, if you wanted. Um, so at the assignment level for equity, um, the practices that we settled on in our institution uh, were two. We decided to look at universal design for learning, um, which is an idea that if you design your course in a way that it is universally accessible to people, regardless of things like um, whether they have low vision or hearing impairments, whether they, for example, have um, access to all the technologies they need. The idea there is that by making your course accessible to everyone, um, it, nobody gets disenfranchised. Now, is it possible to make your course truly universally accessible? I would say no. Um, so what we did is we are picking a few baselines. What are the best practices in universal design that help make the most um, uh, of accessibility? And we are training our faculty on those baselines. And we're encouraging everybody to have a mindset focused around universal design. So that means doing a tiny bit of training about what UDL is, offering specific plans for those baselines. So some of the things we are looking at in particular are video captioning, um, which has lots of integration with things like Google Slides and Zoom. So it's really not hard to do. Um, so the baseline is both in your mindset of thinking about making your course universally accessible and it's in some specific practices that we all agree we're going uh, to work towards, knowing that we're never going to be perfect. Um, we also focused in uh, at the assignment level on varied engagement channels. So we tried to make sure that in no course is there ever only one way to, for example, submit an assignment. Um, so this has particularly to do with the um, technologies that different students have, whether some can participate synchronously or they are only access, able to access the internet, say, from certain Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so again, we figured out what some of those accessible engagement channels might be, and we're making sure faculty have training in them. At the course level, we are suggesting that our faculty look at open educational resources and consider adopting those to drive down the costs of textbooks. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, and we also suggested that at the course level, every syllabus include a basic needs statement. Um, this means adding a statement about um, some of the basic needs that our students struggle with right now. That includes stuff like uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, transportation and childcare, tech accessibility. 
And by putting a statement in your syllabus saying that if students have challenges with any of those things, that they should reach out to their professors, it indicates that we think that basic needs are an academic issue um, that syllabi need to engage with. We've created resource pages for faculty so that if students come to them with an issue like housing insecurity or homelessness, that our faculty know how to refer them to places that can help. Um, so the idea here is that it, it's great if our class is engaging and our learning outcomes are thoughtful, but if our students are hungry because they've lost a job, um, it's not really going to matter how well designed our course is, they're not gonna be able to come to the table to learn in the first place. Um, and then at the institution level, we are advocating with our board of trustees and our system um, to think about uh, the tech access that many of our students don't have. So we have put in a, or we are currently putting in a formal um, request that our, that we set up some partnerships with our local carriers to offer free data plans so that students can use smartphones as Wi-Fi hotspots if they don't have internet on campus and to look at low cost um, Chromebook loaner laptops. We have that in place right now, but not enough to serve all of the students who need it. Um, it's great if our faculty are sensitive to the fact that not all of our students have connectivity, but we can also ask our institutions, not don't just tell us to move our classes online, tell us how you expect to help ameliorate the digital divide that's keeping students without access to technology um, from getting the education that they were promised. And we're also asking, particularly at community colleges, to think about partnering with your um, local homeless sh shelters, with your local childcare services, with your local transportation services, to figure out how we can integrate a basic needs response during COVID-19, to see public higher ed as part of the public infrastructure. That would be great work for um, presidents and deans to be doing um, as our faculty are retooling their courses. We won't be able to solve all of these crises, um, all of these crises, but if our community colleges can help our students see that we understand that if they can no longer afford um, childcare costs, that this is going to impact their ability to do remote learning, what kinds of solutions are people coming up with, um, both in the course design level, but also uh, to deal with this looming childcare crisis? Um, they're not simple solutions, but we want our academic institutions to be involved with them, um, not just to assume they're somebody else's problem. Um, what we designed uh, was a thing we called Slipper Camp. Um, it was like boot camp, only softer and on Zoom, so you could wear your slippers. Um, and what we would do is we would pull apart these ACE frameworks um, and start looking at these different um, practices and helping our faculty go down to just a couple of best practices that they could use in each to improve their, uh, their courses. So if you click on these when, when you get this slide deck, you'll be able to look at what we did at Slipper Camp to help our faculty deal with the UDL of baselines or thinking about varied engagement channels. Um, I will want to show you what that looks like a little bit by talking about OER adoption, um, just so you can see what it looks like to dive into one of the ACE framework um, practices. So when we think about OER, um, open educational resources, what we're talking about is lowering the cost of, of uh, books and learning materials. And we all know how challenged our students were before COVID-19 to pay for college and all of the things uh, that we have to pay for in order to attend college. And if you look at that statistic in the middle of the current slide, this comes from research from the wonderful Sarah Goldrick Rabb. Um, she was in Wisconsin at the time. And her research showed that 50 to 80% of the sticker price for college comes from non-tuition costs. Um, that means things like the cost of books, um, the cost of transportation that students pay to go to college, lost opportunity costs when students have to work fewer hours in order to attend classes, all sorts of things that we are quite aware of, I think, particularly in the community college landscape. Um, but what that means is that if we lower the, the cost that students are paying for non-tuition things like books, 
we are actually taking a huge bite out of the cost of higher education. It has a really significant impact. Um, textbooks in particular, over the past four decades, the price of textbooks has tripled even after adjusting for inflation. The cost of textbooks um, is actually rising faster than the cost of healthcare in the United States. Um, so it is no question uh, that there's some price gouging going on in this industry and that faculty and administrators at colleges are uniquely positioned to intervene in this particular uh, problem. Take a look at this graph. This is where I really got excited about thinking about low cost and no cost textbooks. Um, 22,000 students in this survey, which was repeated twice, once in 2016 and again in uh, 2018, I believe. Um, we're not surprised to see that, you know, 66% of students are reporting that at some time they don't purchase a required textbook because it's too expensive. We're not surprised because we see those students in our classes all the time and they say, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for my check to clear or, um, you know, I'm sharing this book with John because I can't afford it. What you might not know, though, are the other uh, impacts that happen when students can't afford learning materials. For example, 47% report that they take fewer courses because of the cost of books and materials. That means that they are taking longer to pro progress to completion. And when they take longer to progress to completion, the data shows us very clearly that they're less likely to ever complete to get that credential, which means they're left oftentimes with debt and no degree. Um, students tell us they don't register for specific courses because those courses cost too much. They actually choose different majors um, because a certain major, something like biology, for example, um, is too much money for the books, so they choose lower cost majors. Students tell us they drop and withdraw from courses and uh, earn poor grades and fail courses just because of the cost of learning materials. This is not just a social justice issue. Um, it's also a retention and completion issue. So when we're thinking about inst institutional revenue, we are also thinking about the revenues that we're losing because of the high cost of textbooks. So from all angles, it makes sense to try to uh, work on this. Um, the solution to the high cost of learning materials in many cases is open educational resources. Um, these are uh, free, openly licensed materials. Um, some of them are just produced by faculty members and you can find them online under open licenses, but many of them are created by uh, open education publishers. Um, they are grant funded by grants like Davis and Hewlett and Gates. They are highly peer reviewed um, and all of the perception studies that we have on OER show that they are rated the same or better quality than their commercial counterparts. So if you teach an introductory course that has a standard textbook, you can pick something like an OpenStax textbook um, and convert over immediately. And that book will be free for all of your students to access online. If your students prefer a printed version, they can order that for the cost of printing. They come printed and bound and they look exactly like regular textbooks, um, but they cost much, much less, usually between $25 and $50, as opposed to between $150 and $400 per textbook. Um, so OER is a wonderful solution, particularly when lots of things are already moving into the digital environments. Um, there is an OER for everything. So for example, if you teach an upper level or high, highly specialized field, there may not be exactly what you want. But if you teach in the trades, we have things like skills commons. Um, so there are professors teaching plumbing and electrical and all sorts of auto. Um, with completely open um, and free resources. They really do span the gamut at this point. Um, this really is about access to knowledge. We show that students um, uh, in multiple studies, students who use OER perform significantly better on course throughput rates. Um, this, is, this means they drop the course less often, they withdraw from the course less often, and they earn better grades um, if they use OER instead of commercial materials. Um, those results are actually augmented for the most vulnerable students. So minority students and students eligible for Pell Grants. So those are students 
um, uh, living in poverty, those students actually get an even bigger bump in student success when you transition to OER. But it's also about pedagogy because it's not just access to knowledge, it's about access to knowledge creation. Because the open license doesn't just mean that the materials are free, it also comes with the five R's. Um, so you are able not just to use and keep these materials and give them out to others, but you and your students are able to revise the materials, remix them, make them perfect for your demographics so that the text perfectly matches your learning outcomes and the needs of your students. Um, I've also worked with my students um, to build materials to put into open textbooks um, so that they can include student voices and student assignments and student examples so that instead of flushing all of that stuff away in disposable assignments, the students can be sharing their work with the next group of students. Um, and our students have really appreciated hearing um, from their peers explaining different principles. For example, um, if you're struggling with something in algebra, it can be really helpful to have a two minute video of one of your peers from the semester before explaining how they learned uh, to understand a concept. So there's lots of cool things that we can do with OER. If you wanna use it very traditionally like a regular textbook, just order them printed and use them. But if you wanna use them um, digitally or remix them or have your students contribute, there's lots you can do there as well. Um, to learn more about how you can use OER in interesting ways in your classes, you can go to openpedagogy.org for some great examples from faculty practitioners about using OER in cool ways in their courses. And again, we're gonna get all these resources to you afterwards. Um, so just to go back to ACE, uh, what we did there is if you look down under equity is we took one of the practices, OER adoption, and we showed you the beginning of the kind of training that we do with faculty to help them understand the benefits um, and uh, some of the ways that they can engage with that practice. Um, what we're currently doing now is we are, so we've run trainings for our faculty in all of these areas, and you can actually access those webinars right now. We'll, we'll give you the links. Um, but what we're building now is a real curriculum designed for remote learners, i.e. you guys, um, to come in and use this framework, um, click into each practice, get a very short encapsulation of the practice, get some ways to engage and learn about what to do and some next steps for how to um, work on that in your assignments, in your courses, and at your institutions. So by June 12th, we will have um, that curriculum launched. And again, you can just use it off the shelf to prepare yourself for uh, fall individually. Like, it, you know, you can learn about universal design for learning. You can use about, learn about module-based scheduling, for your class, you can do all of this just alone for your course or your assignments. Or you can get a whole group of you to think about doing this um, in a program or in your institution um, and use the curriculum however it works best for you. Um, the idea here is really that when we do our planning for fall, um, think about the mission of your institution. In fact, go back and read the mission statement um, that is so often ignored, you know, when disaster strikes, we do everything but look to our core, right? But let's look back to our missions and let's think about the promises we make our students about pedagogy, about how we teach. And let's try to keep um, focused on that in times of high crisis like coronavirus. Let's stay tied to mission, to pedagogy, and to community need. And whether you are an individual faculty member or somebody like a support staff person from a teaching and learning center or a library, um, or whether you are a dean or a provost trying to plan your institutional response, um, let's try to think about how our students actually learn and what we know about them and what needs they have and build that into our coronavirus courses. Um, that stuff's going to be useful to us because I can guarantee we're going to have more crises like this in the future. They may not be public health pandemics, they may not be viruses, but we know that our students are human and that we're all human um, and that we have very serious human challenges um, that we have to deal with. 
So how can we use adaptability, connection, and equity um, to guide us as we are rethinking our institutions right now? Um, so here is where to go for this particular slide deck. Um, I will also, after this talk today, just go back into the slide deck and make sure you've got all the links to the ACE um, page. You'll want to come back on June 12th or after to see that whole curriculum there. Um, but I am very, very happy to take questions about ACE or about open education or challenges that you've been facing um, because I do think we have about um, 20 minutes. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, ask for some of our moderators to help me out. And I will say I haven't been able to watch the, the chat, um, but I No will. problem. Thank yeah. you, Dr. DeRosa. That was fantastic. I can tell you um, a lot of chat, texts, and emails I've gotten have just been so appreciative of the timeliness of this talk and lots of messages of inspiration. So I think we're all excited and have some really great ideas and appreciate your sharing of those resources and your slide deck. Um, we do have some questions that came in throughout your talk. So I'm going to start with a question from Larry Kramer that came in while you were discussing public good. <clears throat> Excuse me. His question is uh, how much the personal and community benefits of college attendance is exclusive to traditional college programs. Is there any research into how much these benefits are shared by those in workforce programs or trade apprenticeship programs? Um, I don't know the answer to that exactly, except to say that there is very good data about, um, about the benefits of community college. Um, so, so a couple of things happen, right? So community college, whether you're studying in the liberal arts or the trades, there is very, very good evidence that um, most of those benefits transfer over and, and you absolutely make, you know, back the cost of your community college investment plus quite a bit. Um, one of the problems that happens actually a little bit more at the four-year institution than the community college level is when students take let's say three years of college um, and don't complete, sometimes they get uh, the, the student debt without the earnings premium um, credential that, because that usually comes with the, with the credentialing. So the benefits of workforce training and of community college in particular are the lower costs. So, um, so you're not assuming that debt and your risk goes down of uh, whether, whatever credential you get or don't get, um, you, haven't, uh, you haven't amassed that debt because debt is one of the main killers of, of opportunity. So it's one of the main things that we have to watch out for. Um, but yeah, in terms of the trades, all of those benefits um, are there for the associate's degrees in the trades. How they go with um, just sort of like community ed um, or workforce training that doesn't le that leads to say certifications and stuff. I'm not sure if those transition as much to those uh, to those same public um, uh, benefits that Trostel is studying, but I bet there's some other studies that we could look at for that. So I will I will check on it. It's a great question. Great, thanks. The next one comes from Connie Corrigan as you were discussing. Uh, our response to transitioning to remote, remote learning. And she asks, do you think there will be a difference in student expectations for the upcoming semesters where they know in advance that remote learning will be expected uh, in comparison to those who are just like all of us thrust into the environment in the middle of our spring semester? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. And I think we all, you know, also have higher expectations for ourselves. I hope most of you were incredibly compassionate with yourselves in the spring um, for whatever things might have fallen apart on you, right? I will tell you right now, if you need to hear it, that was not your fault. Um, we do have probably more responsibility because we have more time to prepare for fall. One of the problems I think though is that um, students are absorbing, we learned a terrible lesson in the spring, which was that online learning um, pardon my French, but that online learning sucks um, because many of us uh, 
many of us saw some sucky online learning going um, in, in the spring because it was not online learning. It was remote learning in a time of crisis. Um, I will tell you though, for people who think thoughtfully and have time to design intentionally, online learning doesn't suck. It doesn't suck at all. Um, I love face-to-face -face learning. I, almost, I teach all of my classes um, in hybrid environments, so there's always face-to-face -face components. It's my preference. Um, but you can build relationships online. You can have, um, uh, you can use the internet in ways that are so fascinating and helpful to students. And that's not what happens when we just shove everything into the learning management system like Canvas or Moodle and, you know, just make a bunch of stale links that students, you know, learn and test and learn and test. Um, so what I would say is that students are also, they may have higher expectations for fall, but they may also be thinking of leaving college for a semester because they don't believe that online learning can be engaging. Um, but that is wrong, and I think if you feel like that's right, it's probably because you haven't learned enough about online learning yet. So let's use this summer to, to learn about that, um, and I think you'll see the benefits. Now, the, the problem, though, doesn't go away for the digital divide. And in community colleges, I also teach in a rural environment. That's another problem. It's not just uh, poverty that keeps some of my students off the internet. It's these rural environments where they can't have broadband access. So you have to keep that in mind as I'm touting the benefits and potential of online learning as being very connective um, and collaborative. We still have to deal with that digital divide issue. Um, but if we can face both of those head on, I think we can tell our students um, that they can actually have a, an amazing semester. But if you don't know why, you have to learn that first, right? Yeah, and then actually this next question from Mavis Pogue, sort of touches on that. And the question is in regard to the ACE framework and um, specifically if you have quality initiatives built into the online course structure and testing to see if students meet or if the course meets quality assurances. So I'm well, thinking of something I will like say, quality matters. Yes, this is a yeah. very robust discussion in my own institution right now. Yeah. Um, we just got um, an email from our system office that said what percentage of your what percentage of your online class what percentage of your faculty are certified to teach online and what percentage of your courses are quality matters certified right so that's the online learning quality rubric so this is where i just remind you that you know i'm a little bit out there you know so you don't you don't have to come, you don't have to come down this road with me but you know you paid me to be here you may as well get the full <laughs> DeRosa experience. Um, we don't certify people to teach in person. It's weird to certify people to teach online as if there is a thing called online teaching that I could teach you tomorrow and then certify you in. I just believe that online teaching is more dynamic and complex than that, just like teaching. Um, regular face-to-face -face teaching. I think the best thing we can do to assure quality in our online classes is to offer professional development for faculty who do it, to um, realize that professional development is academic labor, so we compensate them as part of it, um, and we engage them in an ongoing, continual conversation about engaging with the internet in their teaching, which is very different than just how to upload things to Canvas or how to make a video to put at the top of your learning management system. Um, so I think there's no replacement for professional development. I would say the same thing, like quality matters, um, rubrics can be really helpful. And there's lots of people who've been teaching online forever. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We can pull some of those in to help our faculty uh, create classes that work well in online spaces. But again, I would say you're, you're going to get a more engaging class if you understand that we still have faculty who are different from each other, teaching students who are different from each other, in disciplines that are different from each other, in colleges that are different from each other. So I think it's really better to equip our faculty with the understanding of online learning so that they can navigate those moving parts. 
Yeah. Um, if you try to put some rubric that somebody designed somewhere else on top of your stuff, it's going to feel stale. So we should use those things and appreciate that they're out there. But um, I don't think you can think of them as a um, panacea to assure that suddenly all your faculty are going to do a great job online. Yeah. And continuing that thread of uh, supporting faculty, offering professional development, and getting basically resources from the administration, Jennifer Hummel asks, if you have any suggestions for institutions who have faculty wanting to improve what they're doing, um, but when they have requests to do research and uh, find resolutions or, and their resolutions are put forward to the, to the administration and then the administration is dismissive and unwilling, how do you navigate those waters? Any yeah, tips? I mean, yeah. you know, depending on my, the year, I find myself swimming in those sharky waters um, yeah. sometimes, and there's certainly not an, an easy solution, but I will say a couple of things. Um, the first is that we applied, and um, a colleague of mine applied for a grant from the Davis Foundation that was primarily focused on faculty, fac faculty um, development. And when we got that grant from Davis, um, when the money flowed in from Davis, it sure gave me more credibility, let's put it yeah. that way, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say looking at uh, grant opportunities, um, particularly now in COVID, there are lots of places that are funding, Davis in particular, that are funding um, faculty development. We just applied for another $25,000 grant specifically for the ACE framework curriculum this summer. I don't know yet if we'll, if we'll get it. Um, so looking at grants can be a helpful way because uh, that money sometimes can, can assist. Um, I would also say that helping, so some of this has to be built and I, I feel like um, unless you have people who really focus on pedagogy at your institution, it's hard to find champions for this. So I was a faculty member for a long time doing this work and it was really hard for me as a member of the faculty to push any of this forward. Once I got um, a job running a, a new teaching and learning center, it was a little easier because now I have time. Um, if you can identify a way to get a faculty member um, some release time to run a learning community or to um, develop a teaching and learning center if you don't have one, uh, that can be great. And to explain to your institutions, like when I talk to administrators about things like OER and why we want to resource faculty um, to work on OER. I don't tell them about all the pedagogical benefits. I show them the data on cost savings that they can tell people in admissions for enrollment. And I show them the data on retention and student success. So sometimes you have to figure out how to pitch the benefits of faculty development to different stakeholders. So the pitch needs to be a little different for maybe a president versus a board of trustees uh, versus your faculty. And the best way to do that is to have someone like me, right, somebody, a um, teaching and learning person who has the time to put those arguments together for you. Great, those are great suggestions. Thank you for that. And just to uh, switch gears a little bit, uh, Kate Doria says, thank you for focusing on student needs, exclamation point. It is so much harder to build relationships and community and an online course. How do we improve in this area? Well, that's awesome because uh, one of the ACE frameworks is about, um, uh, is particularly sort of a, a, about that. So we have a whole little module um, called Building Community in an Online Course. Um, our uh, resident expert on that is the wonderful Martha Burtis. Um, so she works in the Open Collab with me. But she designed a thing you may have heard of. Um, it's not in use in a lot of community colleges yet, but it's in a lot of four-year institutions. It's called Domain of One's Own. And that's a program that gives students websites as a way of connecting them to their work um, and the sharing of their work and using the internet um, more in their work. But Martha um, does a lot of stuff um, around online community building. So she's got some really great um, ideas in there about how to, to make that happen. The one thing I'll say for people is, so I'm not gonna go through the whole list of techniques because there's a lot in that session, but also other sessions that we can share with you. The main thing I wanna tell you is that if you are skeptical about building community online, um, 
I will tell you that your skepticism is, is actually a little bit misplaced. It's mostly that you don't know yet. Um, so some of your students do already know this because they belong to online communities, either through uh, social media, you can think about things like um, gamers, you can think about, uh, you know, e even things like people meeting and falling in love online, which happens quite a bit these days. Um, I have been part of many online cohorts where I have still yet to meet the people involved, but I would consider them in my top 10 best friends in the world. Um, so the main thing you have to know is that if you're interested in community building and collaboration online, many people do it well. We can get those resources to you and you can pick one or two things to try with your students. Um, another thing to do is also have these conversations early in the semester with your students because some might depend on which channels they're comfortable um, using and your students may you know, be different from each other. So it can be a bit challenging. Um, but there are uh, some, some great ways. I will tell you that tonight I am having a game night with a bunch of my student workers. Um, we play Jackbox um, games, which are these online games you sort of play with a cell phone or whatever. And, um, uh, you know, in some ways I've gotten closer to my student workers since we've gone remote. Um, because we've been more intentional about building community. I never had game night with them in the before, you know, and now um, and now we're doing it. So I can tell you that it's possible and that we have some um, help coming for you and uh, we can show you some of those modules. That's great. I like that idea a lot. Uh, we have a couple other questions that came in that I was wondering if I could send to you offline and then we could share your response. They're, they're kind of specific to OERs, but I thought one concluding one that would sum it up nicely and be helpful to everyone is if you could give everyone one key thing to focus on for the start of fall, what would be your recommendation? Um, my recommendation would be find one key thing to focus on for the start of fall. Um, and <laughs> the reason I say that is that what I think is most important, um, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a paid consultant, right? You paid me to come here. Um, and you're paying me, my, my best advice is to say, don't listen to paid consultants. Um, <laughs> you know your community. That includes your college, your students, your home, right? Which is going to be very involved in your fall teaching potentially. Look at your community and decide what the most important things you can do in your area to meet learning needs for that community. So if your area is just this one class that you teach at a community college and that's, you know, you have another job or you're a stay-at-home parent or something, you just teach this one class, what are the one or two things that you know about your work that you can do to meet, to meet needs? And I would suggest doing that within a framework. If you use ACE, that's great. Otherwise, work with your community to develop a framework that's perfectly suited to yours. And that's where you're gonna go to find your one or two things for fall, um, not to me. Although I will say as a last thing, for those who do have like OER specific questions or whatever, um, at my website, which is just robinderosa.net, you can get a link to um, a presentation slide decks. Because I'm an open educator, most of my stuff is openly licensed. So if you want to go tonight and watch an hour long webinar of me just explaining OER to you, I think you might have your fill of DeRosa by then, but if you want to, um, you can do that. So we, we have all that stuff available for you. So don't hesitate. Um, also, I would suggest uh, finding me on Twitter because Twitter, that's my Twitter um, handle in the chat at actual ham, um, is a really easy way for me to connect you to people who do what you do. Um, so, for example, if you teach in the trades, you know, I kind of come out of the liberal arts. If you teach in the trades, there is a whole OER trades community. I can easily um, uh, hook you up with that group as well. Great. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. We really appreciate your time this morning.